cells has a biochemistry that has a 24 hour cycle. Because for the first two billion years of life on this planet, there were only single cells floating in the ocean. And they got fried at noon. <laughs> if they didn't do learn to do, the ones who figured out biochemistry allowed them to sink a little bit in the water column when it gets too hot in the tropics, which where the most of them were, those reproduce better than the ones that get fried by staying up at the surface. And so they all got their biochemistry evolved over several billion years of experiments like this that they did when there was no multicellular life on Earth. And then when multicellular life developed, it developed out of the cells from the ocean. In fact, each cell is sort of like a miniature ocean inside the cell in terms of its chemistry. So we all have the ocean inside of each of us. I was, I, I worked night shift for most of my career. And I managed quite well knowing when to nap and when not to. I didn't, I felt I was able to do it successfully. And then I went, I was in South America and they have some temples that are actually for nighttime, for viewing night skies and stuff. And they feel that there what they did is they go to sleep at sunset but then they'd get up in the middle of the night spend a few hours and then go back to bed um and i think that's i kind of have that in me because i was able to um adapt pretty successfully i don't do it anymore but um i i'm sure you probably are aware of some of that and that's a tangent we don't need to go down no, no, actually it's um, not a tangent it turns out that people like you who um, and a lot of people who are um, night shift workers, you know, they have really, unfortunately, um, bad medical outcomes. Yes, right. right? Not aware, yeah. Well, the reason yeah. is because you're trying to make the cells that have this two billion year le lineage mm -hmm. work on a time. When you change the time scale like that, the biochemistry of all those cells keeps on its 24 hour cycle. And so it gets all, all this, this dynamic system you have of all these trillion cells sending all the biochemistry around inside your body. It gets out of phase, it gets out of whack. And so that manifests itself in medical problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what do you suggest? What, what, what would be the solution to people that are listening to this podcast that are night shift workers? What, what do you suggest, both yeah. of you? I would say, don't think of it as a long-term career um, if you value your health. Um, and I mean, they're heroes and heroines that do this. I was just talking to, I was in the hospital for something and I was talking to a nurse uh, who, who had, you know, who's done this for quite a few years. And, and she said, I just can't do it any longer. And I said, you're right. You're being self-aware. Um, this is... <laughs> I mean, just look at the literature on it. Um, okay. And so, and firemen, police, there's there's the medical workers, there's a whole set of people like this. And there's a whole field of science of circadian biology and right. uh, medicine um, and health Im implications. So the main thing is just like everything else to be aware that just like what you eat, uh, whether you, you know all these things affect you because you are this ecology yeah. you, you, you you know and right. it's and a medicine it's it's great that it's mm. as far as it has but it's it's still dealing with about 10 percent of the parts in the body so 90 percent of the dna bearing cells in your body not including the red blood cells and the platelets don't have dna but if you just take the human DNA, the cells with human DNA, they're 10% of the cells in your body that have DNA. And, and the 90% are in, are in your microbes, in your skin, in your, in your gut mainly, um, uh, small intestine, but general, inner, your, you know, urinary tract, all of these things have, are, have all these things. And they all are, it's the same as, by the way, 
anything in plants. I mean, all the ribosomes, all, all of the roots on the leaves, there's a whole ecology. If you go back to the coral reef, the corals have a whole microbiome uh, of, of different species of microbes on them. And in each case, like any other ecology, the microbes are providing services, ecological services to the host. And the host can be all the way down to a, a coral or it can be a human or a, any animal or any plant. And in fact, you know, if you, the thing that was most stunning to me when I got into looking at the microbiome and, and all of these, I mean, we're a walking ecology. That's what each of us is. Right. Um, is is it's just not fathomable how th this is a microbial planet. There's a little fuzz of plants, animals, and stuff like that, but this takes me back to the astronomy. You know, if you look at the Milky Way galaxy, if you look at you know a galaxy and you see a you know a ten wheel galaxy, there are hundred billion stars in that. Well, there are 100 billion of those galaxies. So if you multiply 100 billion times 100 billion, that's a pretty big number. But now multiply that number by 100 million, and you got the number of microbes on planet Earth. So the biological world is a microbial world. And all of the macro multicellular animals like us, plants, only can live because of the services these invisible good microbes are providing us. None of that is in medicine today because well, we're, just, we're just beginning. It takes just the, beginning. It's tech, it takes the genetic revolution of being able to sequence the, the, the DNA or RNA of these microbes to know what they are and what they can do. Yeah. And that, that's basically 20 years old. Right. right. And, right. And, and what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say integrative medicine and functional medicine does try to <clears throat> discuss and address the gut microbiome as cause of illness and also treatment and also how treatments affect it. Um, um, but you're right. It's it. And now standard medicine is recognizing it, but it did take a long time. And thank you for your work um, has actually been to contribute to um, the gastroenterologists of the world actually um, looking at that as um, something well, that needs to be addressed. I would, I would, I would, you're absolutely right. And I would just say, if you take uh, all of Ayurvedic Indian medicine, if you take uh, right. Chinese uh, medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah, so they, they have thousands of years of, of what we now call clinical trials uh, that, mm -hmm. that led them to think of the core of the body as what mm -hmm. needed to be in balance. Now, they didn't, know uh -huh. what, they didn't know that that was 100 trillion microbes. They were uh -huh. in and they did this, and they figured out a lot of these things, whether it's the Chinese herbs or acupuncture or any of these things, and those work because, as you say, they are they they've learned how to what I call tend their microbial garden. Yeah, right. And those those I I we have one of the largest the, the largest uh, college of uh, Chinese medicine in San Diego, and and you go over there and you go into I work with the head of research of that school and they take you in a room that's as big as the room you're in and and it's from floor to ceiling on all four walls jars this big and each one has a different Chinese herb uh -huh. well those been, herbs not, not you, in San Diego but other places yeah well they have it in in, in San Diego yeah at yeah. the at the Pacific College Pacific of College. Medicine and um <clears throat> So how did they figure that out? Well, when you ingest those plants, they interact with specific microbes that you can either enhance or decrease 
their relative of population in mm -hmm. the ecology. Mm, for sure. Well, I, I would add one other group, which is the indigenous societies. Correct. Their knowledge of herbs and plants is um, amazing. And unfortunately, much of it has been lost um, in the past couple hundred years due to uh, society changes. But um, they clearly had the same ideas. And uh, obviously, we've gotten modern medicines from some of their ideas that turned out to be true, but not necessarily a randomized controlled trial way back then. So. Well, what I look forward to in the future, I mean, this is not one of the things that you... Yeah. Is, yeah. is I do believe that with the emergence of modern technology like genome sequencing that allows us to read mm -hmm. DNA of all of these hundreds of species of microbes that inhabit us, mm -hmm. um, we are going to gradually build a knowledge base that will allow for the unification of these three or four different historical threads of the development of medicine, healthcare, and wellness. So you are in, in, and are in integrated medicine, but believe me, there is a lot more integration in your future as we get this new knowledge and we will able, be able to go back for instance. And then uh, one of the things that I hope <laughs> to see happen before I finish my life is that all of those jars in uh, uh, this school we have here in Chinese medicine, we will understand gradually which of the microbes those are actually interacting. And we will then have a scientific explanation why that aspect of Chinese medicine, traditional right. medicine works. Fascinating, Larry. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and I love, I love this. Let's, let's finish with uh, what you're working on, what you would like to work on in the future. You would, and, and what, I think we need to talk about orchids a little bit, um, about hope, health, and healing in your life, but all the discoveries and what we've talked about that you're involved with, you know, over the last hour, um, where you want to go next and how you've been able to sustain your health and what you're doing now that you discovered to keep going with motivation, which is unlike anything that I've ever heard so far from anybody that we've interviewed. Um, so let's, let's lead off with that. Right. Well, I mean, I kind of have, I guess I've sort of built, I guess what you call it, a terrarium. So in other words, in the house and outside in the garden, we have, um, I just counted this morning because I've spent like an hour with my plants. Um, I have 50 blooming orchids in the house and another 20 in bud uh, inside and outside. And I spend hours sometimes a day, sometimes six or so more hours working in that plant environment and you know i i walk around during the house and out in the garden every day and i look at every plant and outside it's bougainvilleas and hibiscus and roses and um uh, and and i look at every little flower and i see how it's doing and when it begins to be finished with its life i deadhead that and I put it into the compost and then I I I I mean this is a large part of my life. Um nobody seems to know this but <laughs> and it's the balance and I think this is why you know if you go back to all through literature, I mean even in the Enlightenment you had in Germany you had Goethe, you had America, you had Jefferson, they they talk about the philosophical, psychological importance of gardens and your involvement with them. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like tomorrow morning, I will take the orchids that have finished blooming and drive like 40 minutes north to Lucadia, where there's a greenhouse that has like 80,000 orchids. And they have a orchid babysitting service 
and I leave them there in their tender care, and they 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 water them, and they have nice light, you know, diffuse light and everything, um, uh, for months. Uh, and then when they finally respike and they're new buds, I get a text message, and uh, once a week I spend a couple hours going up and bringing the ones in that have finished blooming and bringing the ones home that are in bud. And I'm back to where I was. 60 years ago when I was uh, closely with the plants in their life cycle. And I, it's the life, it's the cycle of life. And uh, being that close and having, you know, 50 friends that are plants that are blooming mm -hmm. in their life cycle. I've got another probably 100 up that are dormant at the moment. So, you know, probably over 100 and 150. And I know them all. And, you know, I, 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 it's my job to pay attention to their needs, which they have individually. Wow. One is separate. Each one has their own needs. And I work with them. And as a result, they are beautiful. And wow. I have that. I'm embedded in that. I mean, that's what I live in. Yes, it's a house, but that's, yeah. it's a living biologically living environment that right. I have in my house. And, and again, have. you have a team that makes this work for you. Well, I have um, three, four uh, wonderful uh, ladies who run the flower the business. And they've just sort of, I, they sort of treat me like one of the staff because I, mm -hmm. I come up and I, they say, oh, hi, Larry. And I go in the back room and figure it and go down to the, you know, there's thousands of orchids and 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 yeah. you know, take care of mine just like a, they would one of the staff members. Yeah. You know, it's it's an engagement in the living world that we are surrounded by, but we often don't think we have a personal reason to be involved with them as individual. They're living creatures, each other, even. Yeah. Each you know, people say, well, gosh, I don't know how you do that. Because, you know, whenever I bring home an orchid from the grocery store, I kill it, you know. Um, and I said, well, you overwater it and you have to, and you have to, and it depends, is it in moss, is it in bark? You've got to, you know, which kind of orchid it is. You have to become in tune with each one of them. And so you've got to know when to water it. Just a tablespoon of water once a week on the ones in moss, they'll be fine. The ones in bark have to be watered and let all the water drain. I mean, you 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 just do that because I mean it's like when you're married or anything else. You're 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 in a symbiosis with this other living creature, and you you know. Now you Beautiful. Say, you have a pet, and I say, you know, you mean you mean just like a vertebrate, like a dog or a cat? No, no, no. I have, you know, invertebrates and plants and. Yeah. Hundreds of them. Do you have an aquarium? Not anymore, because when I came out to La Jolla, of course, there's the Scripps Birch Aquarium, which is a wonderful, um, scientifically run. You don't need one. Huge aquarium. No, no, that was a that was. I have a lot of um, periods in my life yeah. that I go through, and then I sort of have learned all of that. That's you know, um, and I've got. If you look at my <laughs> my research and publication record, you'll see that there are these. It's like Picasso's blue phase, you know. There, there was Larry's aquarium phase. So, but <laughs> it, it, you emerge with so much more knowledge of how the living world, how complex it is, and how what our role is in it, and our responsibility mm -hmm. uh, to maintain it and sustain it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I I can't thank you enough. You've taught me so much, even just now, even though we've, we've known each other for 20 years. You've taught me so much, and I really appreciate you sharing this with our all of our friends, our connections, our team, our global team, whoever they are, um, can learn so much from you. So, Larry, thank you from my heart to yours. For all that you've done and all that you're working on. 
And we'll I just see you again. One question, though. I sure. do have one question. Um, when we're talking about hope, um, with your extensive knowledge of our world, what brings you hope for our planet? How do you stay hopeful for our planet? You know, I believe deeply in science as a way of knowing. And we are, if you think about what we need to be able to monitor um, of our planet, it's so much more than we do now. And, and, and yet I see that like with the forest fires and putting the cameras all over the place and things, I mean, we are going to be able because of the computer revolution and the sensor and the miniaturization of all this to monitor all of these variables of temperature, humidity, you know, land cover, everything, and all the satellites are in it. And this will be going into the cloud to be a giant artificial intelligence uh, system uh, studying all this, and then we will be able to manage it. Now, whether we have, because we can see the changes, we know what we can run experiments, we can run calculations on if we did this, we did this, would that help or something? Getting that's what gives me hope is that we will know how to manage this living planet and how to back out of the climate um, crisis where we've pushed ourselves into over the last couple hundred years of using fossil fuels. Um, that's what gives me hope. If we didn't, if we didn't have the capability technically to manage it, there wouldn't be any real basis for the socio-economic, legislative, regulatory rules to emerge to enable that management. But we are going to be able to have this planet. I mean, look, I, I have an aura ring that's measuring my body. I have my Fitbit. I have my Apple Watch. Well, now give planet Earth all that. All of that. And, and, and with the rise of artificial intelligence that everyone's reading about, it's been coming for many, many decades. And it's just happening to get to the point that it's powerful enough that it's entered the general consciousness of the population. It was coming all along. Yeah. Um, and it will continue to exponentially get more powerful. So, so I think while there's all these scare stories, I think it is the actual thing that will save us in the end. Is And it's the same for medicine. I wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times back in 2011 on exactly this for medicine um, and how each of us will be monitored individually as I am. This is all these, all, all the data, you know, right. every minute is going into the cloud. There's all kinds of issues of privacy and, and security and everything that have to be dealt with, but your cars have already made this transition. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, every car now is completely micromanaged, you know, sensed and everything. And it is going into a big cloud of all the cars across the country and everything into yeah. AI systems. And they'll say, your specific car has this specific thing that's getting a little out of whack. If you go in and change that, this is what we would call in human form preventive medicine then you won't develop a chronic disease in your car. The same thing goes with a planet. Yeah. Yeah. And, so and Larry, I think there's one thing. Is there's, there's something that there's something that you've taught us is that, and this is critical, I think, even for our ending of this conversation, is that we have to work as a team on the planet. If we don't, then it doesn't work. We have to work as a collaborative unit for our planet mm -hmm. in order for like Anne's question to say, how do we go forward with hope? Mm -hmm. And I hope that we can get there collaboratively with somehow, mm -hmm. as we, we, we know people that are working on this, but I, I, I really hope that that's the possibility. 
Well, it is a possibility, and therein lies the hope. Yeah. 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 It, thank you. I, thank you so much. I do feel like thank you throughout throughout history, right? Science and technology solves our human issues and our environmental issues, but um, your collaboration that you work on, I think, is such a key component. Like Sharon says, that yeah. without that, without that empathy of the environment, how you describe your orchids and you yeah. know that time in nature and understanding its complexity without that i think we're in trouble so i although like in medicine yes technology is going to answer i also think we need to treat people as a whole person and we're getting there too so it's kind of like two two ends of the spectrum that are coming together which you have done your whole career which is um so commendable and thank you so much for your time yeah but I think, Anne, that's the point, is that I have, I have seen that work in so right. many different venues. Right. That is why I have hope, because I know it can be done. That doesn't mean it will be done. But yeah. if, if, it, if you knew it couldn't be done, then you wouldn't have hope. Right. But if you do know it yeah. can be done, that gives you the the motivation to do things like like Sharon has done with the fire films and you've done an integrative medicine. I mean, you know, it can be done. Right. It's going to take a long time mm -hmm. and there'll be a lot of setbacks along the way. But I think it's totally, I mean, it's just so rational. We can't live in yeah. this on this planet mm -hmm. with yeah. this living planet without realizing we've got to work with it in a way that it sustains itself right. and that it sustains us. And I think that that will will out in time.